All right, I think we're ready to go this time. Let's hope that uh, we don't have any problems like last time. Okay, so um, we're going to pretend, right, that this is the... So hang on, let me pull up a new one of these thingies. Okay, so uh, we're going to pretend that this is the first lecture, right? Okay, so cool. All right, so now let's, let's get back into the syllabus and then we'll go through that quick and then we'll talk about the first uh, zeroth project, I guess, and then we'll talk about other things. Oh, break was, break was okay. All right, all right. So, um, you know when the class meets, because I see that most of you have showed up to two classes already. Uh, you know who I am because we've done that before. I'm Eric Hamilton. Uh, you can just call me Eric in emails. Here's my email. Um, Discord office hours will be released shortly. I hope most of you are already on the Discord. Uh, if you're not on the Discord, then, uh, you know, get on the Discord or send me an email if, uh, if you haven't received an invite. Um, well, let's check that out. Uh, it's whatever it says it is. Yep, that's what it says. Um, okay. So I haven't created the course GitHub yet because I haven't really done anything yet, but as soon as I start writing code, um, that's what we'll do. Um, this is the book, Data Structures and Algorithms by Goodrich and Tamasia, I think, or I guess I've never said that name, and then uh, David Mount. It's a decent book. So, yep. So the course description is, this is what the university says the course is. So an examination of a range of advanced data structures, well, basic ones too, with an emphasis on an object-oriented approach. Well, okay. Uh, topics include asymptotic analysis, binary search trees, red black splay trees, skip lists, uh, data structures for multi-dimensional data, such as KD trees. Uh, this is an extraordinarily rare thing. Um, I think it gets covered maybe once in every three or four years. Uh, heaps and priority queues, binary heaps, binomial heaps, leftist heaps, and other mergeable heaps. B trees. Um, maybe I'll cover that this semester. Uh, hash tables. Hash tables get covered um, a lot. And uh, disjoint sets. So. Hash tables, you know, when this course description was written probably 800 years ago, um, hash tables were not nearly as important, but nowadays they are used for just about everything. So, um, so yeah, okay. Um, basically, we're going to, so this is my description of the course. Um, we're going to cover things in, uh, this is the way I've kind of divided up in my head. Uh, we're going to cover things in four segments. Um, the first segment is uh, linked lists, stacks, and queues. So basically those three data structures are very interrelated. We'll spend about a week doing them. That'll be next week. Um, and then we'll move on. So then we're going to do binary search trees. So binary search trees um, are essentially the, the bread and butter of this class. Like a huge amount of stuff is in binary search trees and they're implementations and that kind of thing. Um, and then we're going to use trees to create other things like heaps. So you're going to do a huge amount of trees. They might not all be binary search trees, but they're all going to be trees. And you're going to do a huge amount of trees. That's like at least half of the course, maybe 60 or 70% of the course is on trees. So it's spent in here. And so that's part two. Uh, and then we talk about hash tables and other data structures. So, well, I guess heaps are heaps are part three, right? So that's part two and three. And then finally, we'll talk about hash tables, which is like part four. So that's basically the, the way the course runs. I'm sorry my webcam is glitchy. I'm going to, I think I'm just going to turn the webcam off. I'm sorry. Um, I think I need to just get a new webcam or something, even though, unfortunately, I did buy that webcam last semester. So, but it sucks. It is terrible. Okay, that fixes that. It's not glitching anymore because it is gone. So lectures are going to be done via YouTube um, like this. Um, 
So, well, all I'm going to say is this, is that you can watch it live or you can watch it later. If you watch it live, that's good. You can ask questions. If you watch it later, then the general gist of that is that, like, what should I say? Um, as I say here, sometime last year, I think just because of the sheer amount of stuff that YouTube was getting, um, can YouTube can take up to 45 hour, or 48 hours to process a live, live stream. So I usually try to keep my videos under about an hour and a half. Um, of course, this class is only an hour and 15 minutes, but if we do anything where there's extra content at the end, um, then, um, then yes. So, uh, yeah. So homework and other assignments will be posted on the Blackboard. Um, I think one thing we're going to do this semester, and uh, we're, the 341 professors are probably all going to create our own little section rooms, and we're going to have a place where you can, uh, we'll have uh, assignments being posted, and so instead of having to post into the on general for everything, you can post into there. And you can ask questions just to the people in this class. Um, that's what we did last semester, and that's what we're probably going to repeat this semester. I'm just uh, writing some more bot code before we implement it again. Um, exams will most likely have a coding section and a multiple choice uh, section. Um, mm, yeah, I guess that's fine. There's, I, yeah. So, I want to find a better way to do exams. Um, I have been having people submit exams on Blackboard as PDF, and it's it's been difficult to grade. Um, so I don't particularly like that solution, and so even though that's what I was doing in the past, um, so this is what I was doing in the past, and I'm going to try to get away from this if I can. So, whoops. Okay, so yeah, I'm going to try to get away from Blackboard if I can, but um, that's, that's what I've been using, just because it's there. And if I give you any multiple choice, it'll be on Blackboard, but I generally, well, I'll just put here, but, but generally, no MCQ. All the exams last semester were just uh, basically on paper exams that didn't have any multiple choice questions. I don't particularly like multiple choice questions anyway, so if I can avoid giving them, I will. Um, okay, so that's that. Um, here's the general grading intervals um, for the course. Uh, 89.5 to 100 is an A, 79.5 and up is a B, 69.5 and up is a C. 59.5 and up is a D, and anything else is an F, so don't do that. Um, yep, okay. So, yeah, I think, um, I guess that actually they are just 12% each. Uh, C was always the passing grade for 341. In 201 and 202, it's a B. Up here. Let's see. Um, yeah, okay, and so <clears throat> um, I made project two worth 2%, which everybody should get 100% on that, basically. Um, the rest of the projects are worth 10%. I think we have decreased the number of projects in the course as of last semester from five to four. So the projects now, instead of having two weeks to do them, you have three weeks to do them. Um, so that's that's good, I suppose. Um, I'm gonna try to. I'm gonna try to get. The idea is six homeworks this semester if I can manage it, and so they'll each be worth three percent. So that's my that's my general idea for homework. Homework I've been having people submit on Blackboard. Um, but if there's a better way, then I might use Gradescope. I might do literally anything else other than Blackboard. Semester exams, 12% each, and the final exam is 16%. So, yep. Okay. And basically, uh, having a homework policy like this means maybe a homework every two weeks. So, if there's six homeworks, then that would generally mean one every two weeks. Okay. Um... So the prereq for this class is CMSC 202, or a good knowledge of C++ or something like that, and enough discrete mathematics to satisfy CMSC 203. 
Um, generally, what that really means here is induction. Um, and I'm going to be going over induction again, but that's induction. Um, that's a real thing that you're supposed to get out of there. And then uh, late work. So from the pro so late exams are not going to be accepted. Late homework is probably not going to be accepted. Uh, if you need an extension on something, make sure you ask before the due date. Do not ask after the due date. Um, uh, homeworks are, are not going to involve a lot of coding. They're going to be paper assignments. They're going to be more about theory um, than they are going to be about. I mean, I can even show you the homework assignments that I had from previous semesters in a little bit. Um, yeah, OK. Late work, uh, except for projects, where on projects, um, so yeah, on projects, uh, you can have 10% off late per day for three days. So a lot of people, a lot more people take advantage of this than I would like. Um, I think that's the one thing I would like to say about projects is make sure that you start early on them, get them done as soon as you can, even if we haven't covered everything that's on the project yet, because sometimes there will be, if the projects are given three weeks, it's possible that during the first week of the project, you won't have a lot of, um, you know, you won't have 100% of the background, maybe you'll have just started the material that the project is about. Um, but I th it's very important that projects get started early. Um, you know, 99.9% .9 of the reason that people have to get a late penalty is because they started a day or two before the due date and they're just rushing and rushing and rushing and they just misbudget their time or they run into a bug that they can't fix and then then it's all over, right? So don't do that. Um, yep. So let me delete this because I'm not going to do that anymore. Um, so the, the way office hours work this semester are these. So if you're on the Discord server, what you can do, uh, oh god, getting all kinds of, um, okay, that's, that's pointless, and all right, so on our Discord server, I don't know if you've seen how to request office hour help. I'm sure a number of you have done it for, um, for 201 already. So basically what you do is you go to the waiting room and you say you, you post something like request. I'm requesting help uh, to show how it's done. <laughs> office hours are closed. Okay, I'm going to open office hours. Hang on. So, okay, now that office hours are open, I can go quest, uh, help, I need help, please help. So make, make your message uh, more useful than this. Okay, so then you should get a little DM from the 341 bot that just says you've entered the queue. Um, normally, and this is a bug that will fix, the, the requests will... Um, uh, the requests will generally be deleted, but that's just, it's, an, it's a mistake. And so here, what, what the TA does on there, and this is something you don't have to do, uh, we'll accept. And then here, um, you see that I'm helping myself, but presumably I'll be helping you or something like that. So this is where the TAs will help you. So basically, um, what you can do is you can go into the voice chat and you can share your screen there um, or you can type in the text chat, etc. Um, so, okay. Okay, cool. So I think that's basically it for office hours, right? And then when office hours are done, when you're finished and you don't need help anymore, you just hit close. And there we go. And it'll close. Um, OK, so let me close office hours. I keep doing that. All right, so that's basically how to use it. Um, so 
That is, that is the office hours system. So let me just say how office hours with me are going to work. Generally what you do is you go into our course room, which doesn't exist yet, but it will exist, um, and you basically at me. And you say, hey, can you help me sometime with project two or whatever. And what I will say is, yep, how about tomorrow at three? And you'll say, cool, right? So that's that's basically, uh, and then um, that's how we'll do it. And we'll have a, a special room, a special voice chat room there where you, we can talk. So um, that's generally how we do office hours uh, with me. So basically you just, if, if you ever need help, you can either send me an email or you can just at me on the Discord server and just be like, hey, can you help me with this thing? Um, and uh, so, I mean, the, the only reason why I don't have specific office hours is because I'm basically at my computer 80% of the time anyway. Um, so, huh, uh, you know how it is. Um, okay. So sometimes I'll be able to help you immediately. Sometimes if I'm teaching a class or doing something else, I'll just have to, we'll reschedule for some other time. Okay. So the last thing to say before we get on to actual course material is academic integrity, which is my least favorite part of 201, and, uh, but it, and it's also my least favorite part of 341. It's my least favorite part of any of the classes I teach, really. Um, so basically here, I mean, cheating won't be tolerated or condoned. You know, <laughs> this is, so I beg you not to do it. And the reason why is because, um, you know, if you're cheating in this class, what that means is that you're going to have to cheat through the rest of your computer science degree because this class is like the cornerstone of the computer science major. Once you take this class, you have the background for all the other classes in general at the 400 level, even some of the other ones at 300 level. Basically, this is the class that teaches you all the basics of computer science, right? And so, I mean, you, you know some of the basics of programming because you've taken 201 and 202. But this is like the start of what we would actually call computer science. And so, because of that, um, you know, basically for the first time, you get a zero on the project homework or exam. For the second occurrence, um, we refer you to the University Honor Council, and you get an F for the course. So, basically, here's the thing. You can discuss stuff on the Discord. You can discuss uh, ideas with, with other students on the Discord. And the one reason why I'm saying that you can generally discuss things with people on the Discord is because as long as you're doing it in public on the like on topic server or whatever, if you're going too far, if you're sharing too much, right, then a TA will just come by and be like, hey, that's probably too much information to share with another student. And then you can just back off and not share that information and the, and the both of you will be saved, right? So I had a number of people last semester when I was going through the 201 cheaters who all were sending DMs to each other and were sharing code and sharing ideas and, and basically helping each other through the projects and their, their, their code looked essentially line for line identical and they were saying to me like, oh, well, you know, it's not my fault because I over, I, you know, I didn't want to share in the on topic because then I could get in trouble. And the answer is, you won't get in trouble if you share on the on topic. We might tell you, hey, don't do that, but you're not going to get referred to the honor council. You're not going to lose points on any assignment. You're not going to be punished, right? So it's better to talk openly about what you're doing than to go into a DM and to start sharing specific ideas like, oh, hey, when I do this loop, then I do this, and then I do this. Um, because as soon as you start doing that, then you're going to end up way too far in. And um, we use the program MOSS, which detects uh, software similarity, and it is pretty good. It is pretty good. It it uh, it does match people pretty well. So, and I, I I don't particularly like that fact, but it does it it does its job well. So, basically, don't copy material, right? Don't copy from websites. Don't copy from books. Um, except for the textbook, I guess. Don't copy from current or former students um, or any other conscious entity who is not an instructor or TA. So if you're given code by us, you can use it, but don't go online and look for a solution to a specific problem because if you're copying that solution, then someone else might be copying that solution. 
And um, the other thing is don't uh, don't use Chegg. Please don't use Chegg, because uh, the Chegg solutions are often pretty bad, and they're so unique that we can basically tell instantly if someone is copied from a Chegg solution, um, because it's it's usually weird, somewhat correct, but also just so different from anything that anyone produces in this class. Um, so yeah, don't don't do any of this stuff. Um, let's see. Avoid debugging other people's code. Yep, yeah, don't. The whole thing is basically don't look at each other's code. Um, it's it's the number one rule. It's just avoid looking at each other's code because if you do, then your code is going to start looking similar, and then you're going to get caught. Um, and if someone is saying like, you know, if I don't get this project done, I'm going to fail and blah blah blah, right? A lot of people will send you messages saying, hey. You know, if, if you don't give me help, if you don't do this, then, then I'm doomed, right? And the answer is, send them to us. Send them to a TA, send them to a professor. They, you sending them your code, because what's happened, and I've hated this so many times in this class, my first semester teaching this, I had some good students, and one of them got tricked by another student who was struggling that student begged them for their code, said, I promise I'll change my code. I'll promise I'll change your code. They didn't change anything in the code. I mean, maybe one line was changed. It was almost identical, down to comments, down to, you know, line returns in C++, you know, just down to everything, spacing, tabbing, every single thing was identical. It was so beyond the pale. And then that person shared the first person's code with three other new people who were also caught, but they, some of those people modified the code a little bit. But basically what ended up happening is a good student had to get a zero on a project because one bad student copied their code, didn't change anything, got caught, and then three other people got the code from them, didn't change very much, and got caught. So it's, you know, if you think you're helping by sharing code with a single person, what you have to think is like, is this person then going to turn around and not tell me, but then share my code with five other people, which did happen. Okay, and so with that, and you know, as I say every semester, if this is the last time I have to talk about this, then my life improves by a factor of two. It really does. If I never have to say another thing about the academic integrity policy, um, then it, it makes me, you know, unbelievably happy. Okay? Unbelievably happy. So I say all this stuff, please read it, please take it seriously. Get help from us. Don't go to each other. Don't, you know, this is, it's so important not to, not to get caught in this stuff because then you'll just have to take the class again. And I don't want that. Okay, so I think I've updated the schedule. I think I'm basically keeping it as the same as last time. So uh, this lecture got kind of destroyed um, the good news is I had two introductory lectures planned. Um, well, so there's not assigned reading, but when we do the linked list section, so let me pull up the book. Um, what's the book called? Data structures, right? C++. Uh, here it is. Okay, so here's the book. So when we do a specific section, for instance, linked lists, what you'll do is you'll go and you'll go to the linked list chapter and you'll read it, right? And now, of course, it's 50 pages, uh, so you don't have to read all of it. Um, this is kind of training in terms of using books as references. So you're not going to, you're definitely not going to read everything here, but um, yeah, so that's basically it. So, so here you're going to use uh, this chapter when we do linked lists, and then there should be a there's a stacks, queues, and decks chapter. So you notice that we do stacks, queues, and decks next. So that's chapter five, right? And etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So, um, so basically every topic we have has a has a chapter, and so. Um, 
yeah. So basically, that's how to do the reading. Um, I also don't really expect you to do a huge amount of the reading before you come to class. I kind of I teach this class the way I taught all the math classes I've ever taught in all the other classes, where I assume that most people don't read before class, uh, which which is, I mean. It's true at least in 95% of cases. I know that there's probably in this class, there's something like four people sitting there saying, but I read before class. Yes, you do. And I, I'm very, I approve of that process 100%, but I also acknowledge reality. Um, <laughs> so, so yeah. Um, anyway, okay, so what, am I, what else am I doing here? I think that's basically it. So as I say, this is subject to change. Um, it depends on a lot of stuff, um, you know. So anyway, okay. I think that's it for, and I'm glad. I've only wasted about a half hour on the introduction to the course. Uh, when's the first midterm? Uh, who knows? Oh, wait, exam one review. It's right here. Exam two review, right here. Um, uh, yes, I think so. Oh, I, I don't know if it's on Vital Source Books. I don't know anything about that. Um, sorry. I actually don't know. Um, okay. So, uh, basically when I do the exam review, what that means is that the exam's probably going to be this week. Um, in terms of exams, I've been... Oh, I don't know. Let's see, uh, library reserves. I don't have it on my blackboard. Again, I'll have to look at that and see what you're talking about. I'm not 100% sure. Um, yeah, I'm not 100% sure. So, yeah, I see, I see under course materials we have a copyright notice and a. Do you have something other than the library reserves and copyright notice? Because that's all I have under there. Oh, wait, but I'm looking at CMSC 201. Wrong class. Course materials, let's see. Oh, look at that. Um, oh. Huh. Continue. Complimentary copy. Okay, it looks like you're getting a complimentary copy of the book. So try that out. Yeah, I guess you might be getting a free copy. I think you have to give them some personal information, like mother's maiden name and, you know, the number of blood cells you have and all that stuff, but... Uh, yeah, looks like they're going to give you the book. That's amazing. Yeah, it's definitely the book. It's 100% the book. I would not change the book. Um, I mean, even if it weren't the best book, if you were getting that book for free, I would not make you pay for a book. Um, certainly not. Um, well, okay, so you're paying for it. You're paying for it indirectly. Okay. All right, all right. So I think that's basically it. And as I say, I've only wasted about a half hour going over uh, the content from the whole course. So let's get into the course. So I guess the first question is, what do we want to go over first? Let's go over the project first, and then we'll go over everything else. You know, you troll every lecture. I'm about to block you. I mean, do you want to come in? I can let you in. I'm about to talk about the project. Okay. Cool. So yeah, let's talk about this project.
So, all right. Oh, okay, so there's no late submission folders for Project Zero, but who cares? Um, in this project, you will code a, CM, a C++ class by writing a copy constructor, destructor, and assignment operator. Furthermore, you will write a tester class and test program to use Valgrind and use Valgrind to check that your program is memory, free of memory leaks. Uh, finally, you will submit your projects on GL. So that's basically, those are basically three separate things, right? There's writing the C++ code, there's um, using Valgrind, there's, I mean, the test program and the tester class, that's, that's kind of part of the writing the stuff. And then submitting the stuff, that's a separate kind of thing. So I think, well, I'll go over the project and then we'll talk about, um, we'll talk about how to submit for CMSC 341. I think it's similar to the 202 method. And of course, if any of you are not familiar with 202 because you maybe are coming in uh, from a community college or somewhere else, um, we'll go over that, we'll go over the GL server, but let's just talk about the project first. So the puzzle class contains uh, a two-dimensional array, which stores the alphabetic characters like crossword puzzles. For the simplicity, the array is populated with random characters. Okay, uh, well that's sad. There's no meaningful words in the puzzles. Very sad. Uh, the sample output in the file driver.txt shows an example of a table. So looks like this. Very sad. Okay, so I'm going to explain this little chart thingy here. And um, so we, we need to dynamically allocate a two-dimensional array. And so I'll explain how to do that um, in general. And then here we will uh, look at all this stuff. And then we will uh, look at the stuff that's required. So to complete the puzzle class, um, let's see. If the array is of size zero, no memory will be allocated. Uh, the size of the array is specified by the variable m size, blah, blah, blah. OK. Um, and these are square grids, always square grids. Um, so, and then clear is going to deallocate. Um, so this is like something that uh, the course chair really likes, is to have a separate clear method. Um, just remember that your destructor has to call this clear method in order for it to actually work. Um, so this is the alternative constructor. Uh, okay, and all right, this fun calls make mem. Make mem. Okay. Make mem is going to allocate everything. Um, okay, and then we have a copy constructor that creates a deep copy, and you have an assignment operator which creates deep copy. Okay, so that's basically all you need. And then, of course, we'll talk about the testing stuff. Um, yep, so this website has all the projects on it. Um, that's, this is where all the projects are going to be. Just in case that's useful. Um, okay, so then what is this test copy constructor? It's going to test the correctness of the copy constructor. Um, OK, the function returns true, otherwise returns false. There are multiple cases. To check the correctness of copy operations, should make a deep copy, and then test the function to check for that. Uh, or the corresponding values of the two copies should be equal, and the function needs to check for it. Oh, I don't understand this sentence. I probably didn't read it carefully enough. Let's see. A copy constructor or the corresponding values of the two copies should be equal. This function needs to check. Hmm. I kind of understand what he probably is saying here, but I'm not 100% sure that this sentence actually makes sense. Maybe someone can tell me. Um, an important matter in data structures is the efficiency of running time algorithms. And we'll talk a lot about efficiency this semester, which is generally denoted with a big O and big o, omega and big theta. Uh, so this test function is an example of run a lot Analyzing, analyzing the running time of an insertion operation in a puzzle object. Um, so the test function, uh, so it, it is using a reference, yes, but um, it is using a reference, 
But what it's going to do is it's going to, you're in this test copy constructor, you're going to actually create um, a new class using the copy constructor. And then you're going to check to make sure that the, the two things are equal. And then you'll probably change one of them and make sure that they're not equal anymore. Because if it, if it was done by, um, if it was done by value, or I'm sorry, if it was done uh, by reference and not a deep copy, then um, you know, uh, then they would they would start to match each other. So, okay, an important matter in data structures. Yep. So it's a little bit eh, it's a little bit dangerous what he's saying here. We expect that the running time grows linearly corresponding to the growth of the puzzle size. Yes and no. It depends what he means. Um, so the puzzle size is specified by m size times m size. So normally we denote the puzzle size by m size. You say it's a three by three puzzle, so you would say the puzzle size is three, not nine. But in this case, he's already squaring it. So when he says that the expected running time grows linearly in the growth size of the puzzle, what he's actually saying is that it grows quadratically in the size of the dimension, right? Which is usually the variable that you're tracking. So here he kind of explains. So if m size is 1,000, then the puzzle size is 1 million. If m size is 2,000, then the puzzle size is 4 million, which you see is actually growing. You know, it's a little dangerous, as I say, to say that this grows linearly because it actually grows quadratically in terms of the m size, right? Which is the actual variable here. Where, you know, it's like, oh, well, if, if you have a function f of x is equal to x squared, then x squared grows linearly with x squared. Yes, but that's not the point. Right, x squared goes quadratically with x, so that's so that's kind of how to understand this. Um, yeah, so basically, then then if m is equal to n squared, then it's o of m. But that's you know obviously you're like well that's stupid and kind of cheating, um, and I agree. So therefore, if we increase the puzzle size by a factor of four, uh, we expect that the running time increases by a factor of four. So again, what he means by this is if we increase the dimension of the puzzle by a factor of two, then we, uh, this, uh, blah, blah. then we expect that the running time increases by a factor of four. So I would prefer to call this a quadratic relation. He's calling it a linear relation. I think it's a bit confusing. Anyway, so check that a copy uh, is made, the puzzle should blah, blah, blah. Check that the copy is deep. Cool. And I mean, so, so we'll talk about deep copying today. Probably we'll have time. Uh, check edge cases, yep. Uh, for the assignment operator, check that you've guarded against self-assignment. I'll, I'll show you how to do that. And write a test function that measures the running time of the copy constructor, blah, blah, blah. I might not get to this today. Um, we might run out of time. But whatever, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about all of this. Um, and then check for uh, memory leaks. We'll, we'll talk about this. I'll show you some examples of Valgrind. Um, Basically, the point is, uh, this is a happy one. 14 allocation and 14 freeze, uh, and all heap blocks were freed, no leaks are possible. So this is, this is what makes us happy, right? And I'll show you some unhappy cases in just a minute. And then link your shared directory. So uh, this is something you got to do. It's always confusing to me. I always hate this Linux linking directory stuff. But yeah, so here's... Um, so basically, you have to run this command, which is a uh, link command. So if you have, um, this is your directory in his submission folder. And then this will be, so this will be whatever you call your directory. So if you have a CS341 proj, then that's what you'll name it. If you have something that's called CMSC341 backslash projects, then that's what you'll do. So this is whatever. Um, and why don't we actually just go through it? So instead of talking about this crap, let's actually just do it now. OK. So this is just to, for the sake of completeness. Um, I don't know how many of you have not SSH'd into the GL server yet. Um, let's say that you are new to the college and you haven't done that yet. So let me go over this in about five minutes. Um, if you have Windows, then you can do this. If you have um, actually, maybe I'll just do it on my uh, Ubuntu, because it's basically the same. OK, 
Okay, here we are. So to SSH into the GL server, I'll close this because I'll do it again. If you're on Mac or Linux, then you need to open a terminal. Apparently you can go into your little thing on Mac and you can just search for terminal and it should come up. So once you open a terminal, that's something you should Google. Then what you're going to do on Linux is you can type ssh uh, gl.umbc.edu and this is hyphen L, right? So this is not one, this is not, this is an L and then you type in your username if it's, especially if it's different from yours on your own machine. Otherwise it's going to try to log you in. Hit enter, type in your password, password one, there we are. So now it'll give you a warning. It says, don't do anything naughty. You generally ignore that, and then you are in. So, so this is the GL server. So if whatever you need to do in terms of submission, you're going to do here. So let's actually try to do the linking thing. Let's see if I can do the linking thing here. Um, so yeah, let's try to run this command. So let me say... Um, uh, ls. So let's see. Uh, I think I have. Do I have a three forty one directory? I do. And let me make a directory called um, spring twenty one. And then let me make a directory called projects. Okay. So now let me see if I can uh, create the the link. So this is not you. This is uh, this is him. Uh, CS three forty one, and I don't know if I have a submission directory. I think I probably do. Nope. Uh, do I have one? Um, let's see. Oh, okay. Um, so so that's how to do it. And then you can basically uh, copy your the things that you want to submit into this directory, and then um, oops, let's see what happens. Oops. Okay. I guess that's a file. Okay. No idea. Uh, for you guys, it should work. I don't think that there is actually a submission directory for me in on the server. Hopefully, it'll work for you. Okay. Okay. All right. So um, let's. And so that's how you submit your project. Make sure that if you ever, if you're confused, ah, so I didn't have a submit directory, I don't think, because if I had a submit directory, then this would have worked. Um, when I went into my projects folder and I hit ls to show the contents of the directory, it should have showed all this stuff. But because I'm a professor and not a student, uh, I just don't have this stuff. Oh, they're not created until February 9th. So we'll see. We'll see if it gets created. Um, I'll go over it again when that happens, okay? All right, so let's talk about, so that's enough about submit right now. Um, if you actually still need to get on the GL server and you're in Windows, then let me show you how to do that. So there's two ways to do it. Um, if, if you want and you're in Windows 10, uh, one way to do it is to just use the PowerShell. You can actually just do sshgl.umbc.edu hyphen L, your username. And uh, so they have a they have a GL, or not a GL, they have an SSH client on the, whoops. Um, so they have an SSH client now um, by default in Windows. But if this doesn't work, or it's not enabled in your version of Windows, or you're confused by this, or whatever, the other thing to do is you can always install a program called Putty. 
Um, so if you just go online and look for Putty, uh, you can go to this website. And so they, they advertise both uh, Putty and Bitvice. Bitvice has both the file transfer capability and the SSH capability. Putty is just an old SSH client. So you can use whichever one you want. You can either get the Bitvice client or the Putty client. So either way. Um, yep. So this is what I recommend. Or you can just use your... Uh, or you can just use your terminal. So, yep. So those are all the different ways to SSH into the GL server. So I'm actually going to use this one because I think that the font size is big, so I like that. I think I modified the font size here so that students could see it before, so I kind of like the purple color too, or maroon or whatever it is. So where am I? Oh, no, I'm on the GL server. Um, okay. So I'm not going to code Project Zero for you because I think that's a bit of cheating. But what we will do is we're going to code something like Project Zero. So let's try to code something like Project Zero. So Emacs is the text editor I use you know, on, on the GL server. You are free to use whatever development tool that you want. So for instance, um, the different IDEs that I recommend are either CLion or Visual Studio, or um, even uh, Code Blocks is good, and uh, and I think there's an Eclipse C++ thing. I think it's called Kepler. Um, so those are the four that I recommend that I've actually used. They're pretty good. Um, so uh, Project Zero uh, experiment. Uh, let's just call it um, Project. Null. So let's let's make project null.cpp. Um, okay, there we go. Cool. Oops, there we go. All right, and so now let's make a um, instead of making a well, okay, yeah, let's go, just go back into that. All right, now let's include, what's the other thing I want to include? Um, let's say Mr. Line. Okay, so now let's make a line class. So, Okay, so what are the kinds of things that we need for a line class? And uh, what, I'm, what I mean by a line is just a single array, right? So let's put some documentation in here. Um, so we are going to make a single dimensional, that's not how to spell proportional, um, of, of integers. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. So there's usually a default constructor. There's usually a copy constructor that takes a constant reference to the other line. Um, there's an operator um, that returns a reference. Uh, oh, forgot what operator was. And then we'll need a destructor. And then for some reason, we're going to need a clear method. And I guess we need to put in a return type for this, so it's going to be a void. And the only thing we're going to have here is an int pointer um, array. Well, we'll call it the line. OK, so this is basically what the project requires. But it's going to, this, is like a, this is like a reduction of the project a little bit. So 
I just want to get this up and running pretty quick so that I can show you how to use Valgrind and all that kind of stuff. So let's um, let's do that. Let's copy. And then I'll exit. And then remember, on your CPP file, you should have like an if and def. Right? Um, so that prevents multiple inclusion, right? So this prevents uh, the CPP file from being uh, read multiple times. Uh, if it is, then you get uh, multiple definition errors. Okay. So here we go. There we go. And I think that's good, right? That's all we need to do. We're done. So Okay, there we are. And you might notice that I'm not not really doing this in an IDE. I'm not sure. I guess I'm just doing it on the GL server so we can run Valbrand and see everything. So, remember that we had a um A variable, right? Our variable was called. Um, what was our variable called? It was called uh, the line, right? And it was an int pointer. So um, let's actually put a size in here, and let's go back to Mr. Line. There we go. Um, remember that this is a default argument. So if someone doesn't put in a size, it'll just be zero. And then we'll have. Yeah, I don't have uh, C Lion installed on this Ubuntu. This this Ubuntu is a uh, it's a virtual machine actually. Um, I have it installed on my Windows machine. Okay, so we have. Um, Let's even just use n size, okay? Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, I can go back to the CPP. Oh wait, no, no, I was going to go back to the CPP. Um, here's another hint: um, if you do use default arguments, you can't uh, use them for both the .h and .cpp uh, because it doesn't like it. It gives you an error. So so that's basically how I like to start. This is a bit of safety here. What this does is this makes sure, I promise you, you will not regret it if you just set your pointer to null before you start anything. Um, can you use size instead of msize? I think since it's private, we don't care. But if, I think he specifies msize as the private data member in your project. So I would just, if he specifies a name for something, you should stick to that. Um, otherwise, it doesn't matter. So, okay. How do we create a single um, line, or really, uh, a dynamic allocated array, right? And so the answer to that is what we're going to do. And so this is this is a safety check. So if um, m size is uh, bigger than zero, right? Then what we're going to do is we'll say the line is equal to new int uh, m size. Sometimes, and I'm not, I, I forget exactly when this problem can occur, but sometimes if you put a zero into the um, argument here, it can explode. I forget if it's on Windows or Mac or with what compiler, but I've seen it cause trouble. So basically that's why I'm avoiding that. I'm just checking to make sure that the size is bigger than zero. 
and then I create the line, right? So that's that. Cool. So what does this do, right? What this does, so what it does is it asks the operating system to allocate n size integers for you. And basically it puts them all in a row. And so that comes from memory that's called the memory space that uh, is called the heap. Basically the heap is a place of unallocated memory that your program, your program has that space allocated to it, but that program, that, that space is not allocated to any other variables right now. And so basically what happens is uh, there's two parts of the space. There's the heap and then there's the stack. Uh, the stack is for things that are declared um, when the program is basically compiled and run. So for instance, m size is an integer that always exists inside of this class, so that will go into the stack. Whereas um, the line uh, goes into, this thing goes into the heap because it's, a, it's declared using a new keyword. So I'll talk more about the stack and the heap a little bit later. But anyway, so this is how it does it. And then uh, we can populate it with numbers, I guess, for and I equals zero. I is less than m size, uh, I plus plus, and then maybe we'll include random. And then we can uh, just say that this is not really part of anything. I'm just kind of filling it in with random stuff. So um, the line i is equal to rand. And let's just mod it by 100 for no reason. OK, um, cool. So that's, that's all you need to allocate something, right? So what happens if we run this program right now? Let's. Um, Let's make a Mr. Line, and let's say that the size is 5, and make another Mr. Line, and the size is 100. OK? And 2 equals this, uh, and 1 equals this. I'm so used to doing Python when I'm. OK. So I don't have a make file made for this, so we're just going to compile it. Wonderful. A bunch of errors. Mr. Line does not have a type um, because I'm assuming that I haven't included the .h file. That's right. Okay. Mr. Line names the constructor. Uh, not the type. Oh, oops. There is a destructor. There is a destructor. Right, here's the destructor right here. Yeah, there's a destructor. I mean, I haven't done anything with it yet. Okay, warning, no return statement. We're gonna ignore that. Okay, so does this thing work? Yeah, it runs, it doesn't set fault. Nice. No set fault. Um, but what do we do next, right? So now you're going to say, well, what about Valgrind? So let's do that. So here what we're seeing is what? We have three allocations and one free. I'm not sure what the other allocation is because we've only actually done two. But if you notice here, um, it'll tell you definitely lost 420 bytes in two blocks. And what that means is, remember that we did two allocations, right? We, I created, um, let's see, I created this one of size 5 and this one of size 20, or I'm sorry, size 100. And so remember, right, remember that integers 
are four bytes each. So, five times four plus 100 times four equals 420. Um, so basically that's how we lost 420 bytes, right? They were lost because we allocated them and we created these classes and then the program terminated and we never deallocated them, right? So we never actually freed this memory uh, because we were bad. So, um, so let's be good, right? Let's go back in and let's free the memory. So here's clear. Uh, generally, the destructor in, in your programs is just going to call clear. So in this case, what we're going to do is we are going to delete. And remember, if you're deleting anything you, that you ever allocated, so if you delete something that you allocated with brackets, so like new type brackets, right? Uh, then you need to use delete black. Okay? So that's why we do that. So delete. And what it basically what it basically says to the operating system is I don't want to free the thing at the line, right? Because the line is a, is a pointer in itself. We don't want to free that memory. Um, I'm really not sure what the third allocation is. I suspect that the third allocation happens somewhere, maybe in IO stream or random or something like that. Because remember that um, our program is including IO stream and it's including random, so uh, it, it's probably in there somewhere. But of course, they're not they're not leaking any memory, so uh, they free their memory. So we have two allocations that didn't free, which is good. The third one, who cares about? Because uh, that code actually worked. So. So we're going to delete the line, but then remember that the line was a pointer. It still remembers uh, the value uh, which it had before. It doesn't forget just because the memory gets returned to the heap. So this is for safety. You set it to null pointer. And then this is also for safety. Okay, so these two things are safety. Now you might think that if clear, the only time you ever run clear is your destructor, then it doesn't matter, right? So if the only time your destructor, then who cares? But it won't be so care. Okay, that's what I'm saying. Make sure that your clear function is safe in case you run it, for instance, in the assignment operator, which we are about to do. So that's my point here, is so be careful about having some dangling pointers and be careful about having a size which isn't actually the size, right? Because, you know, of course, this program here is not going to be a program which in any way is complicated or uses anything advanced. But in your actual projects, I promise you that you'll run into issues if you don't, if you're not careful like this. So, okay. Um, and incidentally, I will probably just post this. This will be like the first thing that I post on, on my GitHub after we're finished writing it. So you can always go back. So in case you're thinking, oh my god, this was too fast. I don't understand uh, a single word of what he said. Um, you can have all of this uh, as soon as, well, maybe not as soon as, but well, as soon as I post it, right? Um, okay, so now let's run Valgrind again. So let's recompile, right? Recompile our program. It still doesn't like this because of our assignment operator, but we're going to ignore this because we haven't messed with our assignment operator yet. So penal runs, it doesn't set fault. And so now we're gonna val grind it. Where's val grind? Here it is. Look at that. Right? Three allocations, three freeze, 73,124 blocks. So or bytes. So actually we only allocated 420 of those. The rest of it was like operating system slash you know, whatever, um, random, IO stream, STD. But the good news is here, right? All heap blocks were freed, no leaks are possible. Okay, cool. Um, so I just want to show you one thing. 
So I want to show you what happens if you don't include this little bracket here and you run valgrind. So I've only changed that one little thing. So if you notice, this is going to run fine. It's not going to set fault. But then when you valgrind it, you're going to get this. So this is one of the most confusing errors that you can possibly get. Mismatched free. Delete, delete bracket. And then it's going to tell you where it is, and it's going to tell you all this kind of garbage. And you're going to think to yourself, oh my god, I don't know what happened. Right? And here it's going to say, look, all heap blocks are free. No leaks are possible. Right? So everything is good. No, nothing bad happened. You know, we didn't even have any memory leaks, but we had these weird errors. So the way to fix these errors is when it says mismatched free, you look for, right, you go back into your file, and you look at all your destructors, all your deletes, and you say, is this a single pointer or is this an array? And in this case, it's an array, so we have to put that back in, right? So otherwise, you get a mismatched delete. Um, Uh, when you valgrind. Okay. So, all right. Cool. So now let's do let's do these two things. Uh, copy constructors and assignment operators are almost usually pretty identical. Um, so let us make a helper function. Uh, copy line. So I know I haven't really declared it or whatever, but who cares? We'll, we'll copy it into the, um, ah, come on, cool. We'll copy it into the .h file in just a second. So how do you copy a piece of memory, right? Well, there's two parts to it. What you have to do is first, um, so remember that the other line has a, has a dot size. So the first thing you're going to do here, right, is you're going to run clear. And so why do we run clear first? And the answer is because we might have something in there already. So we want to clear it. And then what we want to do is we want to, we want to set m size equal to other line dot m size. I always set the um, non-pointers first, just in case the pointer values are dependent on the non-pointer values. For instance, like if you did something like this, where you said um, the line is equal to new int m size, right? This is good because now we're using our m size. We're not using the m size that's in the other line, right? Okay. So what does this do? What have we done? So Right, we've copied the new size into our, um, what do we call it, class. Um, and we've made a new line. And I know I'm calling it a line, really. I mean, I know that I'm just calling it a line instead of an array. But, you know, basically all of this is analogous to your project. So, OK, but what, what haven't we done yet? Uh, well, we haven't uh, copied the old values from uh, the other line into our program, or into our class. So let's do that. So how do you do that? You go for um, like this, and then what you do is you say, Okay, so that's how you do it. You just for loop through the thing, you copy it, and you're done. Okay, so, um, yep. Cool. And maybe we'll put the if m size check. So if it's not equal to zero, 
back in here. Cool. All right. I guess we can check it if it's positive since negatives are permissible. Okay, so how do we use the copy line in order to uh, do the copy constructor? So actually what we do is we just call copy line because that does everything we need. And now we're done. So that's the copy constructor. And then uh, what does the assignment operator do? So the assignment operator has one extra thing. And if you noticed on the project assignment, it even says to do this because it tries to remind you. Um, what is the problem that you can end up having with, this, with, a, with an assignment operator? And that is if you do something like this, right? If you have a Mr. Line A, you know, and then what you do is you do Mr. Line B equals A. Or I'm sorry, no. Um, if you just do something like this, A equals A. Right? Now you might think, well, that'll never happen. But it could possibly happen. It's been known to happen. So, especially with pointers. If you have like a pointer to A and a pointer to B, but actually you just have Mr. Line pointer and uh, if you have something like this, it kind of hides it. So if, if you ever do this kind of dereferencing thing and assign two pointers to each other, this is, this is probably uh, where this is the most dangerous. And so, okay, so self-assignment is an issue. So how do we check to make sure that we're not self-assigning? So there's a lot of different ways to do it, but this is one way that I've seen a lot of people do, and I think it's not a terrible way. So what you do is you just check if this is equal to, um, and so we have to talk about what this is. Remember that this is a pointer. Um, to the current class, and remember, and so then the reference operator gets the address or a pointer to uh, the other line, and so then we check, right? We check to make sure that they are not the same, and if they were the same then the issue is that we would be allocating and deallocating the same memory, right? Because these would be two classes that are actually the same object, and so they'd be referencing the same memory. So this is how to prevent, this is the self-assignment check. Um, so use this. <laughs> or something, or something similar, I shouldn't be too or something. Okay, and then what are we gonna do? All we have to do is, if it's correct, then you just copy the line. Like this. And uh, there you go. There you go. So the first thing I have to do is I have to actually copy this uh, into my .h file. I think it can be private because we don't need to... Um... There we go. Nope, I don't want to search. I want to save. There we are. Okay. And then... No return statement. Oh, crap. Now it matters because I did that wrong. Um, at the end of a, at the end of an operator equals, so that things like
So basically the thing is that when you do uh, b is equal to a, if this didn't return anything, then it would return a null pointer. And then if you did this c equals, then it would end up with a problem. So basically we return, uh, we dereference the pointer and return it so that it's actually just a Mr. Lang reference. And the reason why we do that is so that things like this work. Um, okay. So now let's recompile. We shouldn't have that error, you know. And of course, no. Um, so let's clear. And then let's run pnull. And oh, I guess we don't actually. Um, so let's create. And then let's create. So one of them uses the assignment operator, one of them uses the copy constructor. And so now let's recompile. And so now let's run it. Ooh, wonderful. Seg fault. Um, so that, that indicates that we need to debug. So in order to debug, what you're going to do is you're going to hit GDB like this. And then here's the commands you need. So you're going to run to run. And then here's the best command in the universe, where. So you notice here that um, we got our segmentation fault in MrLine.cpp at line 80, which was where we call the delete probably. And so that's what we have to check out. So that's, that is this, these two commands are really the most useful here. So just running a program on JDB and then typing where when the thing seg faults. So let's quit. Um, Let's look at the program just a little bit. So what have I done wrong? Uh, clear. Ah, I know what it's doing. It's happening when we call, let me guess, it's happening when we call our copy constructor. Yes. And so this is good because this is very subtle. But it does. It is something that happens. So what's happening is it's calling this and it's trying to clear. And so we need to set the line equals to null pointer. And the reason why we have to do that is because the line is a pointer set to junk data. But C++ doesn't know that. So what happens is when we go into copy line and it runs clear it runs delete on this junk line, and this junk line is probably outside of our allocated space. So that's what happens, is then it's seg faults. Uh, so that's what probably happened. Let's see if I'm right. There we go, so it works now, so no more seg fault. So that's, that is basically the, de uh, that's the development cycle that you should be using on GL at least, is you run your program, when it's seg faults, you do a GDB on it, and you notice that I had to put in a, uh, a special hyphen G. What that does is it tells the compiler to include a bunch of extra data into your executable that allows GDB to read that data and then uh, be able to debug your program based on that. So it gives it, a, like, the, the way it knows where it is and the way it knows what variables are what is because of all that extra data. So, um, so yeah. Um, otherwise, it would just be like, this variable at this location has this value. It wouldn't know that it was exactly one of these objects calling, you know. So it knows a lot more because of the G option. And then we can val grind it. And there we go, five allocations, five freeze. All right. So I think that's, 
I know I've gone five minutes over. I hope this was more or less useful. This is basically your project, right? This is about half of your project right here. Um, I'll talk about how to allocate um, two-dimensional arrays next time. Uh, this is just a single-dimensional array, but, but I'll, I'll do some examples of the other stuff uh, next time. Uh, what else should I talk about? I think that's basically it, right? I mean, I hope... I hope this kind of helps with Project Zero. I hope you see that some of this stuff is kind of scary, but you can kind of uh, go to this part of the lecture and just see what I've done and then kind of reproduce it until you sort of understand it. Um, and then I'll give you the code, so you'll have, you'll have some basis to figure stuff out. I'll create the GitHub. I, I haven't even created the GitHub for the course, um, so that's, that's a good thing. All right. I think that's all for today. I will talk to you soon. Um, we'll talk more about project uh, project zero. We will, and I think so. We didn't just talk about project zero, right? We talked a little bit about pointers. We talked about all the different things that we see in this class: self assignment, um, allocation of deallocation, val grind, and GDB. So it's it's kind of a practical practical introduction. Okay. Um, all right, so that's it for now. I'm going to play the outro scene and then go and post up to uh, stuff. So if you have any questions, just talk to me on uh, Discord. And that's it. Mm -hmm.